everyone. Good morning. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Tis I, Madame Askew, and I'm here with my illustrious, marvellous guest, Madeline Holly Rosing. Welcome back, Hi. Madeline. It's so good to have you here with us in the Temple Entourage tea, tea parlour. So welcome. Well, How are you doing? Thank, thank you very much. I, I have brought my, my tea with me. Large mug. Oh, very good. large mug. Yeah, I Very bring a mug. mug and a teapot because Oh, okay. You need to you need to refresh. Yes. I com I completely I I went and heated this up right before. So I would be prepared. Excellent. <laughs> yeah, no, you gotta have the tea to fuel the conversation. Is absolutely absolutely. Yeah. And if anyone's curious, it is Irish breakfast tea. Ooh, perfect. Yeah, I usually have that in the morning. And uh, lunchtime is uh, the Tazo Zen. It's a lemongrass with green tea, Ooh. Ooh. which is nice. Yeah. And then for a little pick-me-up um, in the afternoon, there is this Hawaiian black tea that I got when I was in Hawaii from Hobbs Farm. It is so good. Oh my gosh, <laughs> that sounds it is so. It's so good. It's um, a little on the pricey side, but... I discovered you can get it like in bulk discount if you don't get it in the little oh, envelopes. Yes. If you just get it just the tea bag and they send it in bulk. And then if you have like a Rubbermaid container, it fits right in and you're and you save a bunch of money doing it. That. And I don't need the little envelopes. Yeah. No. I know no. what I'm drinking. Yeah. <laughs> I no, I'm with you. I I don't need the fancy packaging. I I love a fancy package, but I don't need it. For tea, yeah. what I need is the leaves as the yes. most important part. Yeah. Yes, yes, yeah. absolutely. Oh my goodness. Well, good morning, my friend. It's so wonderful to have tea and <laughs> uh and to have this moment with you. Now we've had you before as a guest for our temporal textual talks book yes. club, and we discussed the book version of your Boston Metaphysical Society, which mm -hmm was delightful but Thank you, you got your start with the graphic novels and that's correct yeah so we're going to talk about your graphic novels and the whole experience of getting into this thing that you've created 10 years ago now right yeah actually it's a little over 10 years I think it was uh last year was our 10th anniversary I believe 2023 I think was our 10th anniversary which was like shocking. I know how that happens and how this is, you know, has evolved. And it shows you how long it takes to produce a comic. Yes. Yeah. 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 And uh, so, yeah, it's very time consuming, um, uh, collaborative and, but ultimately very worthwhile. So uh, for those, for those of you who are not familiar with the story, it's about an ex Pinkerton detective a spirit photographer and a genius scientist who battles supernatural forces in late 1800s Boston. And we currently have up on Kickstarter right now a special limited edition of volume one um, in hardback and softback. Um, the hardback's just going to be gorgeous. We've, we've already made two stretch goals, one for six free digital indie comics and the second one was to add a gray satin ribbon to the hardback. And um, we're only 26 days in. So, you know, we're doing pretty well. Uh, ultimately, I hope to have like uh, foil embossed. I, that's one of the stretch goals in the future, just to make this book even, you know, more beautiful and bigger and better. And, um, and it does contain um, our original six issue miniseries, which, uh, you know, some of you have probably already read. It's been out for a while. Uh, the difference here is that we do have a, a new bonus 10 page story and uh, what I call, uh, you know, weapon sketches from Granville's uh, workshop, which also hasn't been seen before and pinup art, which unless you were with me 10 years ago, you've never seen that either. Oh my goodness! Uh, this yeah. one uh, page I've seen of Granville's uh, weapon sketches is yeah. beautiful, and so quintessentially steampunk. Just 
the vibe, the style of the art is so stunning. It's going to be a very exciting collection. Yeah, John, John, who was the artist who did that, did, did a terrific job with um, from very, some very specific input from my rocket scientist husband to make it as, well, accurate as possible. Oh, I love that. It it looks wonderful. And, uh, you know, I'm I am admittedly not a huge aficionado of graphic novels. I just haven't consumed that many, which is not to say I don't admire them. But oh, no, I understand. I think that yours is so beautiful. Like the art, the way the art melds with the storytelling is really marvelous. So can we talk a little bit about your collaboration with your artists? Because you've had a couple of artists. Yes. And uh, how did you first come to this idea that you would do a graphic novel rather than a long form prose experience without beautiful you know beautiful images well the original story started as a tv pilot when i was at ucla the mfa screenwriting program and it was suggested that I turn it into a graphic novel and then resell it back to Hollywood. Meaning because most executives don't like to read, they like to look at pretty pictures. <laughs> this is genius. Yes, yeah. Uh, but a, a funny thing happened uh, during this journey in that I discovered I really like writing comics. Um, I'm good at it. And I love the indie creator community. And it just, it, it ended up being my happy place. Oh. So I, I continued on, um, particularly, you know, after the success of, of when we originally, you know, finished the first six issues and then continued on with the four sequels and then, you know, Mystery at Pike's Peak, which is uh, on hiatus right now. My, my artist was in an auto accident. Oh no. And uh, about six months ago. So she's recovering. She's just coming back. So, you know, when she's ready, she's ready and, and we'll move forward with that. Uh, but in the meantime, I wanted to get something at least somewhat new out there. And so, you know, put together, we never had a hardback version before of any of the volumes. And so this has always been kind of on the back burner. So I brought it to the front. <laughs> I said, okay, this is the time to do it. And research, I I go through portfolios, like I spend a lot of time looking at portfolios and I was able to get Rebecca Isaacs on board to do the new cover of which she just knocked it out of the park. Um, the colorist, Kurt, Michael, Russell also did a, a stupendous job and, um, and it complements Emily's interior art very well. It's really uh, it's not. Yeah, it, it's nice. I, I really try hard to find cover artists that don't, that, like I said, complement the interior art um, because they are going to look different. There's yeah. it's two different styles, but if they complement each other, I, you know, it, it always works well. Yeah. For me. And it but kind of enhances everybody's and enriches everybody's experience. Honestly, I do love that experience that you are working with a couple of artists and so everyone's art is elevating each other I mean your yeah. your prose the story you're creating uh the verbiage you create for your characters in the story uh is also elevating the art and back and forth there's a real you know wonderful reciprocity between you and the artist that makes it even more and I think that's genius Madeline you are good at this <laughs> but I love that this experience that so many of us as artists have where you have a plan it seems a very pragmatic very practical plan you're going to create this this graphic novel and you're going to sell it back to Hollywood 10 years ago steampunk was very much like hot thing in media they wanted steampunk stuff they wanted those properties and that's just not what happens sometimes that practical plan well thought out does not work out and instead you're on a ride of your life that is strangely working out right yeah it, it 
I, I really enjoy it because um, I'm in control of my own destiny and not dependent on a gatekeeper. Oh, yeah. 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 Because I mean, I've done, I've done the ride. I've, I've optioned things in Hollywood. I've, I've, you know, written treatments I, I've done, um, you know, unfortunately never had anything produced, not unusual. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, um, I've gone the ride where, you know, I've had great producers attached and it's gone up, they've gone to even better producers. And then it's gone up the ladder to, the, you know, the, the president of the even bigger company. And then they decide, oh, we're going to change our business plan from family movies to horror. Oh. And then two years are gone. I mean, because that takes two years. Oh. And that also includes rewriting without being paid, by the way. That's oh. why there was a writer's strike. Yes. Were you, <laughs> as an aside, were you part of that strike? Were you striking as well? Uh, well, I supported it, but I'm not WGA. Okay. No. Yeah. But I, I definitely, I definitely supported it. What and yeah. Yeah. Oh, ab absolutely. Because I had been through that grinder myself. And one of the reasons I'm, you know, if, if someone wants to come make a, a live action or animation of Boston Metaphysical, um, that's great. I haven't been actively pursuing it just because when the right partner comes along, great. Yeah. If they don't, they don't. I'm just not going to stress that <laughs> at well, all. And, and you are able to make your art. This is... I think a, a really important thing that uh, young artists don't always hear is that your success does not have to be meteoric or viral or, you know, raking in the millions and millions of dollars to be valid as an artist. Yeah. Your success, longevity, making the art possible, getting to do it, paying your bills and just getting through a month is high success in the arts and that does not get talked about very much yeah and particularly in independent comics uh we were actually self self-sustaining i think about three or four years in oh wow yeah wow so it was it was paying for itself you know seven years ago that's amazing and so when that was happening it's like okay we we have a thing here yes we actually have a thing where it, it can keep on going and growing and and that's why i went on and well i'd always been writing the short stories on the side to build okay. canon but yeah. you know we talked about the before for yes. prelude uh for those of you who don't know i i have two prequel prose books uh one is called prelude which is um an anthology and the other is a storm of secrets which is a prequel novel and then we did the audio drama. Uh, so it, it works across many platforms, and which is which is really interesting. And, you know, I've had, was it, there was a gentleman, well, last time I was at um, Wild Well West in um, Tucson, there had been a gentleman I've been talking to for years, but he is partially blind and can't really read graphic novels. Yeah. And, but he always wanted to support, but he says, I can't read him. I said, that's fine. No, no worries. We'll chat, have tea. Yeah. <laughs> and then we came out with the audio drama and he was absolutely thrilled oh because God. he could actually now enjoy the world I had been talking about. Um, because we had it in audio. We had a new story in audio format. I love that. Do you, so, do you it's think nice. Do you think you'll do more audio things with your work? Um, I would like to. Uh, my production team is kind of dispersed out into the world, and it is incredibly time-intensive. Mm. Um. I would say unless something significantly changes, probably not yeah. just because of the time I'm, I'm essentially a one person show. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You're and, the whole team. Uh, yeah. Well, I not entirely the whole team. <laughs> I hire very good people. Uh, 
but uh, but by that i really mean that you are you are marketing you are creating you are doing the accounting and the business planning and all of that crunchy stuff that is not even getting the art on the page yet um And then, then you hire people and then you are managing the people and managing your team. It is a huge undertaking as a single yeah. person to do all of that. Yeah, no, no, it is. And um, you have tried to figure out ways to, you know, possibly bring on a virtual assistant or something like that. I just haven't figured that out yet. <laughs> it's hard to find yeah. the balance of, getting the help you need and still having the sort of ability to make certain everything happens and pay your bills, right? And pay people fairly for their labor. I I know because I've read your work that you have that sensibility that people deserve respect, humanity, fair compensation. It of course does not surprise me that you supported the WGA, not only because uh uh you're an artist and you can see the writing on the wall but because you write about equity fairness uh the discrepancies in wealth and these are all things that you are tackling in your works it spills over to being an artist do you find that your own lived experience is part of what is inspiring the stories you're telling in your Boston metaphysical society universe? Um, well, yeah, of course. Uh, it, it all kind of it all kind of spills in from you know my lived life of of what I've seen. Um, I've I've often you know people ask me, well, which character are you? You oh. know, between the three main characters. Oh. And all I can say is I'm a little bit of all of them. Right. And they'll say like, well, which is your favorite character? And they, and most people expect me to say Caitlin, but it's actually Granville. Oh, he's so great. <laughs> he's a great uh, be, Because he's, one, he's often the smartest guy in the room. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and he's just really interesting in in what he has to go through because the world I've set up obviously parallels our own in many ways and other ways it, it differentiates like you know demons and ghosts and such right uh yeah uh but you know his experiences and as you've noted the the themes that echo through all of my work have to do with racism classism and sexism but I also work very hard not to lecture it yes, about it, but it's simply organically what these characters have to deal with. Yes. And sometimes they deal, they can deal with it in a positive manner and sometimes they can't. And that's very real. I think that's, yeah. for me, that's part of the longevity of your work and something I think is so critical to any kind of storytelling but especially in something speculative like steampunk where you are really changing the nature of reality you're shifting history you're adding all of the trappings of steampunk landia to your story having it being grounded in these very real human experiences makes the story resonate i think yeah yeah so, yeah I, I i think so too and I also like to do a lot of world building. The things I like to read have very deep world building. Uh, so clearly that's going to be reflected in in what I write. Yeah, it, and it is. Madeline, yeah. it absolutely comes through. I love that so much about your stories that uh, the moment I first picked up Prelude and um, I was like, oh, oh, Madeline's doing this thing I love talking about classism and not just like uh wafting a feather at it you're really talking about it it never did feel like preachy or like you're just uh lecturing us about it you're talking about it as an organic part of the story it's really well handled very beautifully balanced thank you thank you um it's one of the things i i believe that's that's not talked about a lot in American culture is that 
you know, we don't have, say, the hard to find royalty as aristocracy of, of European nations, but we are still a class based society. It's just talked about differently. Right. <laughs> and I think there's a pretense that we don't have classes and that you can move across mm -hmm. the classes um, with ease in yeah. uh, the United States. Oh, no. And that's not the case. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Oh, no. And it's an important topic when really when addressing anything, but when looking at the 19th century where that discrepancy was so large, it's a very important aspect of the conversation. And these days, it's very reflective of modern society too. So yes. it's very timely. I, of course, I don't know what other readers are experiencing, but for me, that's part of what continues to keep your stories so fresh along with your really honestly your excellent characters so but thank well, you but yeah I, I i'm always fascinated um when when people talk to me about the characters and and how they see them and everything and and it's like wow they they got that that's really interesting <laughs> and and sometimes it's it can be an inspiration for me because I'll get like an inkling of an idea from a comment and, and then it'll go from there. I, uh, spirit of rebellion, which was our first, uh, second, no, sorry. It was our second sequel, uh, was an offshoot of a conversation I had at the original gaslight gathering over at the town and country in San Diego with a fan and we were actually talking about something completely different, somebody else's story. And then it, it gave me an idea and I'm like, oh, we should see the repercussions of Caitlin's actions and how that affects her life. And then came Spirit of Rebellion. Oh. So it, it's always interesting having conversations with people about your work or reading reviews. I don't read too many reviews because they, Particularly on Goodreads, which is like crazy town. It is um, crazy town. It is crazy town. I, um, an, yeah. <laughs> an author, an, another author I really admire uh, said once that she felt Goodreads was not for her as the author. That it was mm -hmm. for the readers. And so she just doesn't engage with the reviews there because it yeah. is sort of the fire hose approach. And there's no... Um, there's no vetting. So you don't know the quality of the review, but you also don't know if the person reviewing is a good actor, right? So Yeah, you you there's a lot. Yeah, you 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 don't know. And um yeah, I just remember uh I think I got a two a two star on the Storm of Secrets from someone. And I'm like, okay, that's fine. I you know, legitimate. But the only comment was, is like, ah, there's too much politics in this. I'm oh. like, did you, did, if you read the back matter, the first word is politics. Right. <laughs> right. But also, if you've read the original, the politics is also there. I mean, yeah, yeah. There's, it's never not baked into your story. And yeah. uh, I, you know, it's well, I have a degree. I have a degree. I have a BA in politics. So there's, yeah, there's that. There's that. Yeah, there is oh. that. Yeah. Oh my goodness, you're definitely going to have some <laughs> insights. But also the 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 thought that uh, one can divorce politics and political thought and any sort of cultural analysis from looking at the past is always. I'd say that's true about the present, but certainly when you're looking backwards at the past, there's going to be political context because we've got the whole scope of things surrounding what we're looking back at. It You oh, need yeah. the context, right? Yeah, you do need the context. And yeah, I see uh, Anti Farfa says, I have a BS in political science. We'll never look at the world the same again. That's true. I mean, and civics and yeah there needs to be more civics taught in i think at the junior high school level not just high school i you know start I, them young i agree and also i think that those little cartoon jingly cartoons in the 1970s that were like 
uh, you know, I'm just a bill on Capitol Hill were really good. We could use more of those too. Just a very quick snippet for how, uh, you know, the political how laws, how laws are made. Yeah. Um, I have to give huge credit to um, Josh Gillian, who does, he's the legal geeks. Oh. And he uh, does um, panels on at, at almost every major convention that he can get to. He's out of San Jose. He's a, he's a lawyer. And what he does is he uses pop culture to explain American jurisprudence. And it's fantastic. And the, the, the most famous one he did was the court martial of Poe Cameron. And this was at San Diego, I think a few years ago, it was or, or pre pandemic. It may have been pre pandemic because I know it was standing room only. They had to, they had to, shuttle people out but he brought in he always brings in like real uh, lawyers appellate court judges district attorneys prosecutors he hired an actor to play poe cameron and he had his own defense attorney and there was a prosecutor and the audience was the jury ah. and so they did a court martial of him and and walk through and so by entertaining the audience, they were being taught how American jurisprudence functions in a trial and in a, you know, in a courtroom. And eventually they did vote to convict Pokemon <laughs> of, um, uh, of dereliction of duty. Um, actually not dereliction of duty. It was, he, he ignored orders. That's right from in the Star Wars movie, he ignored orders. He was ordered not to do something and he went and did it and a bunch of people died. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's fantastic. I I love that, that whole concept of bringing information to people in a way that's entertaining yeah. and engaging. So that's, that's like a type of pedagogy that sometimes gets lost. And mm -hmm. uh, it makes it makes panels sound like, well, we're going to class time and we're going to learn things. But you are, which is sort of beautiful. You are. And, and he's done things like, uh, you know, insurance claims from a, um, a kaiju attack or, you know, something. like. Yes. Oh, my oh, goodness. Yeah. So no, good. so. So, yeah, I don't know if he still has the podcast, The Legal Geeks, because um, he, he used to. I don't think he has time for it anymore, but he does do the panel. So if any of you out there are at a, a big con where he's at, absolutely go to the panel. You will have a blast. It'll, it'll be very interesting. You'll learn something and you'll be entertained all at the same time. But I mean, I really think what he's done is just genius. That's fantastic. Thank you yeah. for sharing him uh, yeah. and introducing us to his, his podcast and, you know, his name. I'm certain that, you know, wherever he streams his podcasts, uh, they're still available. So yeah, listen to his are. back catalog um, it, because it sounds really fascinating. And these are things that I know I think about when I'm reading different stories or engaging with media. What are the consequences for the average person? So, but this sort of brings us a little bit to this wonderful thing that happens as you say the independent creator community and mm -hmm. i think is critical to have this kind of fecund ground where you are around other artists and talking to each other and learning from each other because it helps us all sort of expand our art and i'm curious you you mentioned early on that you know you're an avid reader and that other things you know you've been reading other things inspired by other things what are some early things that kind of inspired you to get into steampunk was was there a book or a few books that were just sort of like the thing that made you want to make your own steampunk stories um well it wasn't really so much that it, it was by accident more than anything oh uh, when I wrote the original TV pilot, I think it was called 1900 Detective Agency. It was uh, set in 
late 1800s may feel may you know male female detective and that's how it kind of originally was developed until a friend of mine suggested that I redevelop it in a steampunk world and so I had heard of steampunk didn't know a lot about it and then just went and just did research you know wikipedia uh it was a long time ago, so I'm not quite sure what I what I read at, at the time. Uh, but then I agreed with him that it it was a great setting for kind of a marriage of my love of history and my love of science fiction. And so it worked it worked really well. So I did redevelop it, and then sat down to for a new name, and. Um, it's always been set in Boston for for story reasons. And so I said, okay, if we're talking about ghosts and demons, what are the words? I mean, I had lists of words of and types of things that I want to see agency because agency was like, that's too modern. And club is has a different ring to it and so I was literally like circling and diagramming different names until I came up with, Boston Metaphysical Society. It's and went a like, great title. That's it. Yeah. Because I'm using metaphysical in the way it was used back in the 1800s to evoke, you know, you know, the paranormal and supernatural events, unlike today, which has it has a more philosophical, spiritual bent to the term. And I often have to explain that to people who come to the table and they say like, oh, do you deal with us spiritual, spiritual, something, something, something? I'll be like, no, <laughs> yeah. we're talking paranormal, supernatural. I'm using it in the way they used it back in the 1800s. Right. You're, you're not thinking John Dan. You're not thinking no. uh, philosophy classes, no. right? It is no. that wonderful. Uh, and it's at a perfect time because the, spiritualist movement and a uh, deep fascination with the supernatural was happening in the 19th century yeah. in actuality and so the what if possibilities with that are marvelous and something you really delve into with your stories I love that yeah yeah it's 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 definitely been a lot of fun uh but but yeah it, it's always kind of interesting when people come to my table and they go off in this kind of offshoot spiritual bent and I'm going like no and they look confused <laughs> go like no that's not what we do here no <laughs> distinctly not I mean I I personally prefer what you are doing with your stories uh everyone's mileage may vary of course but I think that you do a wonderful job of balancing the fantastical and the science fiction in this wonderful steampunk melange which is i th i think 10 years ago 12 years ago when steampunk was sort of at a peak there's a lot of debate a lot of online bickering about whether or not steampunk could have magical you know supernatural paranormal elements if that was okay and you and a few others were like doing that thing. You, Gail Carragher, Beth Cato, had yeah. some fantastical elements. Did yeah. you did you get pushback from the steampunk community, or did you feel really embraced right off the bat? Um. Well, the comics community had no problem with it at all. Um, the there may have been a few people who may have mentioned something and clearly I ignored them Good. Uh, <laughs> uh, also I, I was also relatively new to this steampunk world and so I'm you know people would just there'd be things people would say like oh you know to dress in steampunk you have to wear brown I'm like why who told you that right right it's like what no yeah um wear fairy wings and sparkles and green no, who cares wear, yeah. <laughs> wear yeah. what you want be what you want if that makes you happy that's great and 
Besides, it's pretty. It's um, pretty. It's very pretty. Uh, but yeah, it would come to me in different ways in that other people will come, maybe because I'm older. I don't know. I'm older. I'm a woman. Yeah. And people will, would talk to me, particularly younger women, about pushback they had had. And I'd say like, ignore them. And they'd, they'd be all happy. Yeah. And they'd say like, oh, I'm going to go do my thing because you said it's okay. I said, well, one, you don't need my permission. And two, yeah, go do your thing. Don't listen to them. If, if yeah. But you know, fighting back against any sort of gatekeeping can sometimes be as simple as validating a person like that and telling them no you really can do what you want even though they don't need your permission right no so and there's there's a quality of your stories that is about validating those experiences we talked a little bit about um the ways in which you or the or the fact rather that you work in the isms the racism sexism classism into your stories and that's very validating i think for people in marginalized communities to come to your stories and read those things um see themselves see their real experiences it helps chink away at the gatekeeping out there yeah it, i th- i i know that this is like a lived experience for many of us and i'm I'm fairly certain you've had your own experiences in a variety of realms uh, with sexism and classism and, yeah. you know, born witness to racism. But was that a thing when you were starting out with the stories, when you were making your first uh, foray into this, did you say, I'm going to make certain that this is at the heart of my story? And was there a moment that sort of inspired you or... Let me reward that a little bit. Was there a piece of media that you liked and you felt like this is not meeting that need and I'm going to be the storyteller to do it? Um, I know when I first was developing the story, uh, I wanted to make sure that I didn't have a Lily White cast Mm. when it was originally envisioned as a TV pilot. I said, I'm not going to do this whole lily white everything. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I'm definitely going to have, you know, female involved, white male. And and then I did my research. I found Granville. Uh, for those who don't know, Granville T. Woods is an actual historical figure in um, American history. He was an inventor and a scientist himself. Um He's originally from Ohio. I brought him to Boston because I'm the writer. I can do that. Yes. <laughs> and he was just a, a really, there's not a lot known about him because he did, he did get lost in history. And I literally like found him on a list and saw like, oh, he lived in the same time period as Tesla and Bell and all these people. And to find out that he had actually sued Edison for stealing some of his patents and won. I'm sure you've heard me tell that story before. Uh, but he was the perfect um, addition to the team. Yeah. And and what I didn't really realize at the time in developing Samuel Hunter, uh, who's kind of a guy who, who straddles two worlds between middle class and upper class because of his, because of his wife, um and his relationships in the arist- aristocratic world uh what at the time i didn't even realize what i was doing was he had the power to create a space where people like caitlin and granville could thrive and that's what he did yeah so sometimes he may not be as dynamic I mean, he is, he ha- he has his own way about the world and his own vision of the world. Um, and he tends to be a little overprotective, um, but that's what he really did is he was, he had the ability to create this space and he did. Yeah. And it's so um, important to create those spaces when you have the capacity. Yeah. Um, 
because yeah, he he had the ability to do that. Coming, he was he was well educated, uh, and you know, and as a former Pinkerton, he had you know skill sets. But he also, I don't. For those who haven't read the first volume, I don't want to give anything away or from or storm, but yeah, he has a very he has a very dark past and and trauma ridden, and he's trying to deal with it and not always in the best way right i mean they're yeah. flawed your characters are not uh mary sue's at all then uh, what's the male equivalent equivalent uh i can't remember uh, I, I, yeah, <laughs> it uh yeah anyway then they're not just self-inserts they're not perfect they're not you know capable of doing everything flawlessly I think that's part of their magic is that they're flawed and they're trying their best and they're trying to do the right things, but they, they miss, they miss stuff. And oh, yeah. certainly our, our, our gentleman who's making space is not going to be perfect at it all the time, uh, which yeah. is not, it makes the stories more interesting and more provocative in a, in a good way, not, not in a, you know, I don't mean negatively, but as as you've been doing this, as you've been creating these stories for for a little over a decade now, and you you were in the business of creating stories before you started out with the Boston Metaphysical Society, what has been a sort of surprising lesson to you as an artist over the last decade? Um, that I can be successful at it. Oh, yeah. yeah 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 you just you you don't know and it, I, I was at a, a con a year ago and um talking to, to some other writers and I think I mentioned like oh yeah such and such is doing such a great job you know oh I think I think I was talking about Shelly Adina she was oh. a guest of honor at Clockwork yeah. and she and I were chatting it up the whole time and she's a marvelous writer fabulous human being um I'll I guess I'll see her in about a month. Um uh there's another woman there who and I was talking about like, oh yeah, I'd I'd love to be at you know Shelly's level. She's doing all these great things and da-da-da. And and this other woman looked at me and she goes, I want to be you. Yeah. And I'm like, oh <laughs> yeah, that's so nice. I, do you really want to <laughs> do you really want to do, really do that? Yeah. Well, there's that tension, I think, as an artist. I know I feel it where I'm very driven, which is incredibly important because mm -hmm. uh, we are not going to get uh, meetings with our boss who's like giving us a progress report. There's no one else making our schedules for us. We have to do all of that and we have to be interested in striving ever forward to continue to produce the art but I think for me along with that drive is always the sense that I could be doing better and mm -hmm. so it's very hard at times to stop and think oh this is success I have had some success I am doing the thing my art is out there so that is, I love this story. This is a wonderful uh, anecdote. And also I think for those of you watching out there later, this is a good lesson as an artist. Remember that somebody is looking at you and excited and wishes to be where you're at. So uh, thank you for sharing that story. Yeah, and um, I'm trying to remember exactly what she said. Uh, I used to be a competitive epee fencer when I was younger, I comp competed both here in the States and abroad for the United States. Wow. And this was before it was, Epe was in the Olympics. So yes, I'm that old. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yay, fencing, yeah. I was, uh, I'm five eight, so I was an Epe fencer. So yeah, they put the big weapon in my hand. Um, I loved it, I, I, I loved doing it, but it's one of those things where in the in the beginning you tend to progress very quickly yes. and then you plateau and it's a real struggle to go through the plateau before you reach the next level yeah. 
And so you do have to have the discipline and the mindset of like, okay, we've, we've plateaued, you know, we may have to be at this level because there's other things happening in life yeah. where I just can't devote the energy or what's going on. Um, but that too, if you keep pushing in small increments, you will get farther along. And um, yeah, what you notice, particularly in fencing, and I think in life is, yeah, like I said, you progress very quickly in the beginning, you plateau, and then every step after that are baby steps. Yes. You know, just tiny, it's baby steps, and you you improve incrementally, tiny, tiny ways, and uh, uh, and it's hard. You know, you you have and you have to go through that in order to get to the next level. Sometimes it is uh, unendingly hard <laughs> to to. It can be. It can last a long time. It can last a very long time, yeah. and so you know. Fortunately, I I think I had the the background. I brought it with me. I brought that lived experience with me, and which has been helpful. And I, I see uh, Alicia going. Damn, technical fencers are both difficult and fun to write, Ooh. fun to fight. Um, yeah, that's true. And, uh, yeah, I trained with, with the men as well, which, well, that was both good and bad. I'll put uh, it that way. Both yeah. mostly good, mostly good. Once you get to a certain level, uh, the guys usually like fencing with you because they can practicing because they can work on technical aspects of their game, but yeah. Um, and you get a lot of bruises. <laughs> but you yeah, well earned i'm certain uh bruises now alicia is um our resident sword enthusiast fencer and a historical fencer so oh cool uh i'm i know that uh, she is probably delighted by this turn of events and i i don't think i knew this about you that you'd been uh really astounding uh epe fencer and that that was one of your passions but i absolutely see the connection between doing something rigorous like fencing and then being an artist because art is rigor like you must be rigorous to do art you must yeah. have that dedication to be successful and it's it's sometimes very tiring because the the struggle is continual so speaking of the rigor, the struggle, the need to continue. Um, when I am thinking about art and talking to my fellow artists, I'm always curious, what is a lesson or an adage or a, a piece of personal, you know, found strength that you like to pass on to younger artists who are coming up and who are who are just starting out their journey oh i don't want to data dump on you <laughs> like, but there's so much there's so, so much. much so much um i would say particularly with writing take a lot of classes uh you know find find your people uh find a writer's group or a class that has writers who are at your level and a little above because the ones a little above will help bring you up. Yes. And learn to distinguish between personal criticism and constructive criticism. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, you'll, it, it's hard. I, I almost wish that everyone went to, to film school who as a writer because you learn to develop a very thick skin to criticism because you get your ass handed to you on a regular basis in film school. Um, and even sometimes the personal criticism, there might be a note behind the note. So you have to yeah, think past whatever that personal thing was and think like, what are they really having a problem with? Is there something or is it just personal stuff and I'm like okay never mind move on yeah um I think that skill of like a never mind move on I think is very important 
it's easy to take all of the criticism personally. And yeah, it 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 is, and um, I know some people do. Uh, I have my um secret weapons is I have a couple of beta readers for comics and the prose, and they always give it to me straight. And one of them, he's always he's always like, "Cause I'm I'm afraid I'm gonna hurt your feelings," and I'm like, "No, that's not that's not gonna happen." And uh, and I appreciate and I appreciate his time and effort and um and truthfulness because it just makes my stuff better. Yeah. And I would rather go do a page one rewrite and make it better than do something that's half-assed. Yeah. And and I guess that's another thing too is that sometimes like there have been times when I've done a full script, you know, it's done. And my manager at the time would give me a, you know, say like, well, what if it was like from this point of view or that point of view? And I'm like, oh, she's right. Oh no, She's absolutely right. But, and that entails a page one rewrite yeah, completely. But if it makes it better, it's worth it. Learning, learning that skill of taking criticism that is constructive that's like very underline that multiple times the constructive mm -hmm. part is important yes but also being able to give that feedback in yes the time. so I know early on when I would be presented with um stories and novels to read for people as a beta reader I also really struggled uh with that thought that I might be too mean I would be squelching the the creativity and I have learned that giving good constructive feedback is a gift to an it artist. Is. It is it is it definitely is and you always want to you know start with something positive mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. like you know I love the overall concept of what you're trying to do here the, the story the setting um, you know, I think you chose, you know, the right kind of characters, if in fact that's true. Um, and then said, but, you know, you might need to dig deeper here, or I'm having some bumps in the road with the plot at these various points, it seems, uh, you know, go back to your character and see if that's really where they want to go, yeah. you know, kind of thing. And I've often found when I'm writing something and I hit a bump, that the answer, I've already written the answer and it's back here somewhere. And I have to go back and find it yeah. that I've already solved the problem that I've run into. And, um, and, and that happens to me now, like all the time, it's like, okay, I'm having a problem here. And then I go back and find the answer back here and pull that out and solve the problem. I love that. Yeah, just going back to your own work and the truth of your characters. That's beautiful. Well, Madeline, yeah, I, I, oh, pardon me, please go ahead. Oh, that's right. No, it's like sometimes it's, it's you've written it unconsciously. It's just from your subconscious and you don't yeah. realize it. You're just like. Right. <laughs> yeah. And I know that you are an author who has a plan when you are writing, but even with a plan, it's possible to be in that state and and miss that you've already made your solution or have your answers in the story. So going back to the work, that's lovely. Oh yeah. 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 Well, my friend, I realized that I could keep talking to you for an infinite amount of time. And uh, because you are a delight and I just want to, before I open it up to questions from everyone, I want to say that uh, you also have, not only do you have these beautiful Boston Metaphysical Society books, but you do have resources. Uh, you have a guide for Kickstarters for other creators and that you do share your experience and information as a guest and uh, an artist in the community. So if people want more from you, they should pick up that book as well. And they should come see you at Clockwork Alchemy and other conventions. Absolutely. Yeah, I'll season. be at WonderCon next weekend. Oh, my gosh. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah, I'll be at WonderCon next, next weekend. Uh, yes, you're right. I have a, a book called Kickstarter for the Independent Creator. 
Um, the second edition with the green cover is out. Um, some caveats for that, it's a few years old. Yeah. Uh, so I will tell you that all the basic strategies are completely legitimate and, and still work. Uh, but Kickstarter itself is a constantly evolving platform. So a lot of those things have changed. Yeah. Um, but, you know, they don't, yeah. I mean, yeah. they've literally changed, they changed things through the year. Right. Yeah. I mean, this is uh, a thing about being an artist, an independent artist, creator in this modern era. We rely on these uh third party platforms or these platforms we don't control like kickstarter like mm -hmm. uh patreon like kofi or facebook or what have you uh, we don't control the programming the changes the rollout of the changes we ride mm -hmm. the wave so uh, yeah for good or ill sometimes so but i love that you created that resource and if anyone is out there making independent projects and you want to get involved in a kickstarter and do that madeline is an excellent exemplar of how to be creative your current kickstarter is live right now for the hardcover yes. uh release of your first edition looks absolutely stunning there's some wonderful bonus little things you can get as well as the basic book um the little metal business cards and things they look so lovely so go support madeline's kickstarter i know that i did and uh, thank you you are welcome <laughs> like oh oh i can have them all in this nice little packet on my shelf how delightful that is absolutely my gem yes um, we have hardback softback and digital yes so if you're like me and have well an office filled with fulfillment material. I know digital works works for okay. me very well. <laughs> I love digital. I'm a huge advocate of digital uh, yeah. media for that reason as well. So my darlings, uh, so here in the Zoom with us, a wonderful Patreon community. Um, if you have some questions, now is your time to unmute yourselves and ask. Uh, Madeline is marvelous and here to answer your questions. To those of you watching on Facebook, I'm gonna pop in and see if there are any questions there right now. Um, and uh, But my wonderful uh, Patreon community, I am eager for your questions and I know Madeline is as well. So please unmute yourselves and uh, then I will call on you. Or raise your hands or whatnot, you know. You know the drill. Uh, if you don't have any questions, that's all right. I will ask questions. But <laughs> I wanted to give you an opportunity, of course, to ask your own questions um, about anything related to Madeline's work or the Boston Metaphysical Society or being an artist in general. Ah, I see her. Alicia. Alicia, please ask your question. Are there stories or side of me put aside? Yes. The big answer is yes. Um, I have been stopping and starting a novel trilogy for probably the past five years. The first book is written. I was 20,000. I was finally able to get back to work on the, the second novel last year. Got 20,000 words in when my father passed away. And I was the executor. So basically the last six to eight months of my life has been dealing with that. But that novel trilogy is called, I hope to get back to it in the next few weeks, hopefully right after the Kickstarter ends, uh, is called The House Wars. It is a prequel to the graphic novels uh, and is about starts about 30, 35 years before volume one and is my world's equivalent of the American Civil War and features a airship pilot by the name of Gwen Warwick, um, who is uh, not only uh, a, an airship pilot, but an airship designer with her father and her having basically been called up to help in the war effort uh, in Boston um, kind of under 
the, what would you call the, not control, but having to live in the house of the great house Wellsmore and her relationship with Beatrice Wellsmore, who's the head of that great house. Um, my inspiration for this was we don't see a lot of stories between two women who are of different ages who are not related. And there are also different classes yeah, and different skill sets. And Beatrice Weldsmore, you meet briefly in Prelude uh, in the story called Steampunk Rat, where she's, it was, it's after the house wars. She's still head of the house, um, but much older. Uh, and I really wanted to dig into her. I, I really love Beatrice. And Gwen was an interesting character and there's many, many other characters as well, but they're, they're the central relationship and uh, how they deal with um, not only, a, you know, the growing threat of the Southern great houses revolting, yeah. but a new, potentially a new demonic threat. And there are Easter eggs throughout that you actually, if you read the graphic novels, everything actually links with everything else. So you can read one story and it's a complete story and you're fine. But if you start reading the other stories, you'll see how everything enriches everything else. And um, I specifically designed it that way, mm. which also and means I have to go back and read material because I forget. <laughs> of course, but it sounds so good. I am uh, with Alicia on this it sounds so good i am excited for you to have the time and the bandwidth to uh finish that the so bandwidth is a, yeah the band bandwidth has been a thing yeah. yeah yeah and uh you know not to to brush away the reasons why you don't have the bandwidth but i um i am excited that you are creating and doing and i look forward to when you can uh do more again and make your yeah own. And, and it's interesting because you know talk of the writing experience there's um a character you meet in the first book and and you see him and you know you like him but his character is much more expanded in the second book uh so and yeah he's it's fun well, you know, you know what this means. First of all, clearly we have to have you in, back to book club to discuss your other uh, novel uh, that uh, rather than just prelude, we're going to have to get in to the other Boston Metaphysical. Oh, Storm, Storm of Secrets. Yes. Storm of Secrets. Yes. And then when you finish this work, we're going to have to have you back for that. Oh, no. More wonderful things to read. Um, Absolutely. So, so Bill uh, Barden has joined us in the chat. Hello, Bill. And Hello. Uh, Bill is uh, my wonderful co-host and co-organizer for the Temporal Textual Talks book club and a wonderful avid reader as well as a lover of comics. And he asked, how do you handle promotion to get the word out for your books? Um... I do a number of things. Um, I have uh, a news. I have multiple newsletter email lists um, that I use, um, and obviously social media. Uh, I do cross promotion with other creators. Uh, that's one thing that the comic, uh, the indie comic creator community, does very well. Is we work together uh, to cross promote. Um, I mean, I start scheduling cross promoting before we even before I even launch, and note who's going to be up and on and who's in my wheelhouse. So it's a, a you know a good shared experience for the backers too. Yeah. Uh, so I haven't really done any advertising yet, and mainly that's just because I haven't had the bandwidth to go figure out how to do that. Yeah. Um. So that's on me. Yes, I could hire someone, but. Ooh, then you have to hire someone. Yeah. Yeah. And it would have to be someone I really trusted because we get slammed with spammers uh, before, I mean, even before we launch, like I have, you know, the coming soon Kickstarter launch page. Right. right. And, and I, you know, I got that up and 
hadn't even started advertising yet because I go on my own schedule of yes. when I'm going to do things and I'm already getting hit and they're going like, well, you have only 10 followers and blah, blah, blah. You'll never be kind of like, oh, go away. Uh, I know what I'm doing, dude. Go away. Yes. And, you yes. know, in the next week, next week we have 300 followers. So, yeah, I, yeah. Um, uh, you know, and being consistent with the newsletters, I, I just do it once a month. So I don't make people crazy and I try to make it fun and not a, you know, not a deep read. Uh, and so people just know, okay, this is going on. Okay. This is fun. This is fun. And they move on for their day. I love that. I love that. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> Christina asks, uh, says it's always fun to see you in person. What are some conventions you are scheduled to attend mm -hmm. this year? And I'm going to add uh, to that question. Is this information people can find out by joining your newsletter? And how do they join your newsletter? <clears throat> yes, um, you you can find it by joining my newsletter. Uh, you can go to my website or either my Facebook page. I believe there's a link there. And uh, also on my website. I believe, uh, don't use a contact form. That's been funky lately. That's not quite working yet. Mm. Um, yeah, but yeah, there, I believe there's a form there. Uh, where else is there that you can just link? Um, yeah, I think those are the best things also on my website, on the blog. I I just recently posted one yesterday and at the bottom I always put you know upcoming events uh but to and there it is uh but to let you know yeah I'll be at WonderCon next weekend the 29th to the 31st and then about three weeks after that I'll be at Clockwork Alchemy up in San Mateo what's after that I have my list over here yes I'm I'm almost completely, I'm, I'm analog and I do it both because, well, it's easier. Yes. Uh, yes. Oh, and I'm, uh, if you're down in Anaheim, I'll be at the Anaheim, at Anacon, April 27th at the Anaheim Central Library. I'll uh, also, I'm on the waiting list for Comic-Con Revolution in Ontario in May. So that's up in the air. Uh, I'll also be at StokerCon uh, in San Diego. Uh, and Hellmouth Con, uh, I'm going to the ALA conference. That's the American Library Association conference in San Diego for the first time this year oh. and San Diego Comic-Con. Oh my goodness. That is a heck of a schedule. And I wish you such a good time at all of those events. I have heard such amazing things about ALA. It is a wonderful event. So have a wonderful time. Yeah. yeah, that's a yeah, very all... busy schedule, though. Yeah, it's not as busy as past years, and I'm waiting to hear back from Rose City, and I may do another one in Michigan. I tried, I do like maybe two that I fly to a year and try to go somewhere else. Like last year, I was at Baltimore Comic Con. Yeah. Um, but this year, I'm going to look into doing Grand Rapids, uh, in Michigan. One, my publisher, Source Point Press, is there. So it'd just be nice to see the gang. Absolutely. <laughs> oh, I love that. I love that. Well, I uh, have such a good time at those. And uh, and for all of you who want to keep up with Madeline, I know for me, my newsletter has become the thing that I want people to opt into because uh, if you get it directly in your inbox, you're more likely to see it, which I love. Yes, so. yes recommend joining that newsletter um all right tracy asks um where can people find your audio drama oh um one it is part of it's one of the add-ons for the kickstarter so you can get your own download there and you know help keep us going uh, there's also a cool flash drive and a CD if you prefer a uh, higher sound quali quality wave file. We do have CDs. Uh, and also it's on Spotify. <laughs> Excellent. 
also on Spotify. I love that. That was fantastic. So uh, I haven't listened to the audio drama and now I know what I shall be doing. And um, I love an audio drama. I've, I've become a lover of audiobooks. I yeah. I know that there's a lot of production and time and cost in doing them. But if you've got one, then it should be enjoyed. So uh, Absolutely. thank you. Thank you. All right, my darlings. Any other questions today from our wonderful Patreon community or over here amongst our dear friends on the Book of Faces? Um, don't see any more Facebook questions, but uh, friends here in the uh, tea parlor. Let's see. Yeah. yeah no, there is a danger... Yeah, that there's the danger with Kickstarter and backer kit, right? There's so, yeah. oh, so many wonderful projects, so little time and, you know, so, um, all right, Madeline, I like to wrap up with okay. a few special questions before we end things up. I'm a huge fan of ridiculous French interviewers and ridiculous French literature it's a weakness. And uh, so I love Proust and the Proust questionnaire. So I have my own little modified shortened version. If it, for those of you who know Proust's work, uh, he, he makes me sound very succinct. Um, he is wordy. And um, he had a questionnaire that was like 30, 40 questions long to get oh to know God. people. Yeah, no, absolutely out of control in uh, Proust form. Um, but I have a much shortened version, and so I'm just going to ask you a few questions to wrap up our wonderful interview conversation today. May I say, before we go into the questions, thank you for your time. This has been truly <laughs> wonderful. Thank you. I mean, I love talking to you, and we never actually get a chance because we're at conventions, and it's like, what? For it's nothing. crazy. It was like, it was like, well, let's can we go hide over here? It's like, no, someone like pulls you away. And yeah. 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 And you're selling <laughs> your wonderful books in your wonderful, you know, your booth, or you're running to a panel from your booth or from a panel to your booth. And I'm like running and by. You're, right. And you're, yeah. And you're doing your thing. And yeah, it's, there's never enough time. Yeah. yeah. This is our time to actually catch up outside of the convention space. And yes, absolutely. To, to, you know, natter on about our favorite things. So, all right. Uh, my first question from you for you is what are your favorite qualities in a human? Um, well, honesty uh having respect for other people and uh a sense of humor oh, good and point. intelligence yeah and intelligence yeah yeah I mean, you, you did marry a rocket scientist so i did marry a rocket scientist so yeah there's there is that yeah <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right what do you appreciate the most in your friends uh well one be the ability to listen <laughs> uh and being honest but kind yeah. particularly if you're going through something yeah yeah yeah, honest but kind. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. There, you know, there are those people who say, well, I'm just being honest, but it's really mean. Or no, they're just, just being mean. It, it they're just they're mean. just trying to they're just trying to poke you. Mm, yeah. yeah. Honest but kind. That's beautiful. Um, all right. What is the virtue you strive for the most in yourself? Virtue loose definition of virtue i know loose definition of, of virtue um probably to be the best writer and person i can be 
however amazing. however that comes out yeah um uh I think a long time ago, I was on a panel with Harry Turtle Dove, and someone asked me, you know, who is who's your favorite writer? And of course, I didn't want to offend Harry because I love his writing as well. And of course, one of them is is Ursula Le Guin. And I remember saying, I said, I don't know if I'll ever be as good as writer as she, but I can try. You can try. Wow. Oh. She is a, she's really a powerful house of a writer. Yeah. And, and the same thing with Lois McMaster Bujol, oh, who's just, oh my God. I love oh my her. God. I love her work. Oh yeah. They're both stunning in their own rights, like differently stunning, but yeah. Uh, I, I think that you are a brilliant writer in your own rights, Madeline, and really forging your own pathway. So, you know. For what it's worth, from well, one. Thank you. Always, always trying to be better, and yes. Um. Yeah. Can't. Yeah. Can't wait to really start. I am outlining. I was invited to do a short comic, uh, for an anthology, um, called Holiday Spirits: The Monster Edition, oh. and I uh chose Medusa, <gasps> and I'm really having a good time with that story. Ooh. So and I I pitched it to the editor and he's like yeah go do that. Oh, oh. <laughs> so what I'm going to yeah. do? So it's a very different take on Medusa. I love that. I and I um I love Medusa and uh, I love the reimaginings of her story that are happening now. So I'm very excited to see what you do with that. Um, all right. What is your ideal occupation for an afternoon? And by occupation, I mean like thing to do, not necessarily a job. Or a hobby? Yeah, a hobby. <laughs> or or doing nothing can also be an occupation. Just how do you like, on a, your perfect day, when no one is telling you what to do, you get to choose the thing you love to do for the, the afternoon. Well, before we had the drought and then the rain and then, <laughs> and then the fires uh, here in Southern California, um, I really love gardening. Yeah, and I don't get to do that anymore because it's just a uh, lack of space and the stupid ground squirrels and rabbits eat everything. And yeah, so uh, when, when we eventually move and eventually we will, uh, that's one thing. I don't need like a big, huge, I don't need a farm. That's crazy. Um, but... <laughs> <laughs> who can he can deal with that it's like let's a couple of fruit trees and like a raised bed you know like one maybe two raised beds that's it tomatoes bell peppers i'm a big fan of raising tomatoes particularly the tiny little ones like the yellow teardrop because oh. those you can just you don't have to slice them you just wash them and throw them in your salad and they the flavor explodes in your face a little burst of that acidity Oof. yeah Yes. So good. Oh, I love that. And now I'm I'm envisioning you in a really great gardening hat and gloves, attacking the weeds. Um, all right. What is your idea of happiness? Sleeping seven hours without interruption. Oh. Ooh. Ooh. Oh, that is nice. <laughs> Seven whole hours. Oh. Seven whole hours. That's nice. Yeah, yeah, I could be very happy about that as well. <clears throat> yeah. Um, all right. What do you regard as the lowest depth of misery? Um. Well, let's just say the last two years of my life, I've kind of experienced that. So I'm I'm not sure I want to express that right now. That's very um, fair. That's very yeah. fair. Yeah. Uh, it's been a, it's been a very challenging two years. So and I'm I just at this point I just real really feel that I'm now coming back into the world. Welcome back. Yeah. From those two years and. Yeah. Uh, May you have more seven hours of uninterrupted sleep 
uh, having been in the trenches of the lowest depths of misery, you certainly have deserved a reprieve. So welcome back. Yeah. All right. Thank you. This is a good follow up to that. What is your favorite swear? Oh, um, hmm, it would probably be. Uh, probably be oh fuck me. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Yeah, I feel like uh the frication and the sort of mouthfeel of the word fuck makes it singularly uh peak swear for a lot of people, but yeah. in so many beautiful iterations. Uh, I, my background is in linguistics. After I got out of the high rising very affluent world of opera um and uh it's just such a good word <laughs> such a good word so final question uh okay. what is your personal motto i'm not even sure i have a personal motto yeah it, it never occurred to me to have one um Other than there's a phrase, it's not so much a motto, but a phrase that I think applies well to um, today's world, uh, which is do not mistake compassion for weakness or empathy for lack of will. Yeah. That is good, uh, a good standard to live by. Yeah. And, uh, great response to the world right now. Yeah. So, Madeline, thank you for your time today. Thank, thank you, you very today. much. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Such a pleasure. Uh, this has been a wonderful conversation. I do love having you as a guest. I am excited to include more of your books in the future. But right now, everyone, I highly encourage you to go out and back this Kickstarter because this special edition of uh, the first the first edition um, of the Boston Metaphysical Society is so beautiful and the stories are so wonderful. Steampunk has been, you know, sort of on a contraction for a little bit and uh Finding great stories, I think, can be a little bit harder. But I have to tell you all that Madeline brings absolutely pinnacle top tier stories to the table. Wonderful characters, gorgeous art with your your artists with whom you collaborate, Madeline. And just a wonderful world. It's so deep and rich. So treat yourselves, pick up a steampunk treasure, support an independent artist and uh, back the Kickstarter. So Madeline. Thank you very much. And thank you. I appreciate it. My pleasure. And everyone on Facebook, thank you for being with us. We're going to wrap up the live on Facebook to our wonderful Patreon community who are here with us today. A special thank you to all of you. Without Patreon, none of the tea and tomfoolery, certainly none of this Saturday morning nonsense would be possible. Patreon is the stalwart backbone of our temporal entourage community and uh, probably the cheekiest of cheeky strumpets, honestly. So um, if you like some cheekiness, if you don't like to wear gloves, if you want to be involved in tea and tomfoolery, our Patreon is where it's at. So thank you, Patreon subscribers. Uh, and as we go out into the world, I want to remember, uh, remind everyone to please treasure yourselves as I treasure you because you are irreplaceable little gems in the world. You are bringing goodness and magic to the people you meet. You are improving someone's day, even when you don't know that you are. So please wash your hands, get your boosters, uh, eat your vitamins, drink the good tea and pick up a good book. I hear there's this Boston Metaphysical Society you should be reading. So go out and read a book today. <laughs> All right. Good. Good afternoon, everyone. Have a wonderful 
wonderful afternoon. 